been going through the book of Luke, the gospel of Luke, and um, it's been quite a study, as um, Luke basically um, was an investigative reporter. Everybody say investigative. So the Luke was actually hired by his boss, Theophilus. That was his name, Theophilus. Um, he's Theophilus' boss. Anyway, Luke was hired by Theophilus to investigate whether the story of Jesus was true. You see, Theophilus had come to faith in Christ, like many of us. But he had doubts. You know, oftentimes you doubt whether or not it was all true. It's the story, Jesus' life, Jesus' ministry, who Jesus is. Was it really true? And Theophilus started to have some doubts. So he said, I'm going to send Luke, an investigative reporter, to go and find out if whether or not Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God. If, in fact, he was the Messiah. So Luke, who was not a believer at the time, he was not a believer in Jesus. He was just a worker, an investigative reporter. And he packed it up from um, wherever they were at in, 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 in Greece, went to Jerusalem, to Israel, and started his investigation about Jesus. The first stage of Luke's investigation was to find out or prove whether Jesus was a real person. Why? Because the Greeks had so many mythological demigods. The Greeks had a lot of demigods, those who were half man, half god, in their, in their legends, in the stories, like Hercules and Achilles and Orion and Perseus. And so Luke needed to find out if Jesus, who was supposed to be the God-man, wasn't just another one of those. So Luke went out on this investigation. I mean, because the stories of Hercules and Achilles and Orion and Perseus had circulated and been repeated and, and they had been hailed. Um, but, but here was the fact. None of what was said about them could ever be traced or proven. All those mythological stories, all those stories about mythological characters, that's why they're mythological, could never be proved. They were legend or fiction or folklore. Kind of like La Llorona, you know what I'm saying? Or skinwalkers in our culture. I mean, we all know about it. We've all heard about them. But eh, we haven't really met them, you know what I'm saying? And there is really no tracing who they are. And so the idea is that's the way these mythological Greek people were. And so Luke says, I need to find out if Jesus not, is just not one of those. Need to prove the fact that he's a real man. Because Jesus, on the other hand, could be traced. Everybody say, yeah. yeah. Jesus could be traced. Jesus left a footprint, a family, a birth, a home, a school, his ministry. Jesus left a fingerprint of his life. And so Luke went to go investigate it. Luke interviewed Jesus' brothers and sisters and neighbors and classmates. And the Gospel of Luke, this book that we're reading, is the case file. Everybody said it's the what? The case file of Luke's findings. And he proved that Jesus was a real man. Had a family. Had a, had a ministry. Had a life. He interviewed the people in and around Jesus' life after Jesus died. So after Luke established that Jesus was a real person, the second stage of Luke's investigation was determining if Jesus was divine. Everybody say divine. So the first step was Luke checking out and finding out if Jesus was for reals. You know what I'm saying? For reals. The second was to find out if Jesus was truly divine. If Jesus was in fact the Son of God, the promised Messiah, the fulfillment of Scripture. So Luke, as he's finding out, as he's inter making, doing interviews, he documents Jesus' miracles. All to prove that Jesus is this Messiah. 
He documented, Luke documented Jesus' power over sickness, power over disease, power over demons, power over death. And we've gone and we've read some of those stories, those accounts, eyewitness accounts of people's testimonies about Jesus and his power. But here's what I find unusual. Even in the midst of all of those notable miracles that Jesus did, some people still refuse to believe. Now, you and I are 2,000 years separated from that. But these were people who in their lifetime witnessed all of those things, all of those miracles. And yet, they still didn't believe. In fact, Matthew and his record says this, Matthew chapter 13, verse 57. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is honored everywhere except in his hometown and in his own home. And Jesus could do, read it with me, no mighty miracles there because of their unbelief. Wow. So even during Jesus' ministry, Luke is documenting, all of the miracles and outstanding things that Jesus did. And yet there are still some then who didn't believe that he was the Messiah, that he was divine. So here's what Luke documents as he finds out about Jesus' story. What Jesus did in those areas and towns in which people didn't believe that he was the Messiah, and maybe because he was from there. He was an old town, a, you know, a hometown boy. They, they recognized him. They said, ah, that guy can't be the Messiah. No way. I went to school with that guy. That guy made, me, made my furniture in my house. You know, that guy, I, he can't be the Messiah. Come on, Messiah. Oh, he's from Nazareth for Pete's sake. He's not even from Jerusalem. He's from the ghetto. Can't be a Messiah. So here's what Jesus did. Jesus said, well, if they won't listen to me, maybe they'll listen to someone else. Here's the record. Then Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to curse, cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said to them, take nothing for the journey, neither staffs, nor bag, nor bread, nor money. And do not have two tunics apiece. Whatever house you enter, stay there. And from there, depart. And whoever will not receive you when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust of your feet as a testimony against them. So they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel, healing everywhere. Isn't that awesome? So here's what happens. Jesus says, okay, these, a lot of people in and around these areas are, don't believe me that I'm the Messiah, even though the miracles are there, and even though I've declared it, they don't believe me, so maybe they'll believe someone else. So Jesus surrounded the undecided, unchurched unbelievers with his message. How did he do it? Jesus sent out his disciples with the task of showing them what he is all about. He told his disciples when he sent them, freely you have received, so freely, everybody say the word, give. You've received it, so give the same thing. Jesus sent his disciples out to pray with people, heal people, teach people, help people, serve people. And he told them, and in the process of connecting and helping and praying and serving with people, Jesus told them to do this. Everybody said out loud what? Advertise. Jesus said, publicize me. He said, promote me. When you get out there and you're praying for people or talking with people or you're connecting with people and serving people and helping people, they're going to ask you, why are you doing this? How is it that you have this power? How is it that you are articulate and, you're, and you have this wisdom? I want you to tell them, Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Savior. He has sent us out to publicize Him and His message. I want you, so in the course of touching people, I want you to advertise. Everybody say it again. Advertise. So when the disciples heard this, they hit the ground running. 
They hit the road and towns with, with a confident courage. And kind of like the Apostle Paul declared in Romans 1.16, this is how they went out. Everybody say it out loud. Read with me. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is God's powerful method of bringing all who believe it to heaven. Isn't that awesome? So the disciples took it with that kind of energy and that kind of passion. And they said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We're going to go out there. We're going to touch people's lives. We're going to help. We're going to serve. And as we're connecting, we're going to advertise Jesus Christ. He's the reason we're doing what we're doing. Now, guys, Jesus has commissioned us to do the same thing. Look at your neighbor and say, me. Look at the neighbor and say, Me. Jesus has commissioned us to do the same thing. To serve and to touch and to help and to pray and to advertise and invite. No more slacking. Say it out loud. No more slacking. Like our favorite mouse always says, Arriba, arriba, andale, andale. Right? Or if you're partial to the other mouse, Giddy up. Right? Or he, he says it kind of in a weird voice. Giddy up. Whatever he does. Anyhow. You get the message. Don't procrastinate. Don't get comfortable. Don't stay parked. Because things that don't move get rigid and atrophied. They are prone to rust and rot. Jesus doesn't want us to rust or rot. Jesus wants, uh, want, here's what he wants. Everybody say it out loud. Uh, let me hear you say it again. Revival. 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 He wants an awakening. You know, when we reflect and mimic Jesus in the world, it causes revival. It causes an awakening. Because people want to meet and know the one that is behind our life change. I mean, you know, they, you, know they, you, be, you have this wisdom. You, you've got more peace in your life. You've got a little bit more calmness and self-control. Maybe you've, you've kind of, your life seems to be getting back in order and, and it's not as chaotic and dramatic as it was before. And people recognize that and they, they, they come and say, hey, listen, I've noticed, you know, you're not, a, you're not that jerk you've always been for the past 10 years here at work. And, and, and what, what is the reason? And you're able to say, you're able to advertise, right? You're able to advertise. And it creates revival. It creates an awakening. Really? People want, people want to meet the one who we're promoting. In fact, that's what happened when the disciples ended up coming back from their mission. Here's what it says. And the apostles, when they had returned, told him all that they had done. And then he took them and went aside privately into a deserted place longing to the city called Bethsaida, going to a retreat. But when the multitudes knew it, all the multitudes that the disciples had been teaching and ministering to, when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, Send the multitude away that they may go into the surrounding towns and count country and lodge and get provisions. For we are in a deserted place here. All right? So, the disciples hit the ground running. They go into all these places, preaching all these towns and preaching and advertising about Jesus. And when they got, come back, they're all excited. Everybody say excited. Because, you know, when you're out ministering to people and, you know, doing God's work, it gets exciting. You feel good about it. You see things happen. You see it puts smiles on people's faces or peace in people's life or counsel and strength and, and encouragement in those that are around you. And, and you get pretty excited and they're telling them about it. And Jesus said, good, but you guys are exhausted because it's been this, this you know, town-to-town -town mission. So I'm going to take you away for a little retreat, a little excursion. And so there they are at this, little, you know, at this little excursion. Jesus takes them camping outside the city of Bethsaida. And they're there recharging after this town-by-town -town campaign. And all of a sudden, people from the towns that they had been ministering in came out to see and meet the Jesus that the disciples had told them about. 
we, hey, we, hey, we're here. The disciples probably didn't recognize some of these people. I'd stayed at some of their homes. Had recognized some of the people that they talked to. And they went out and they, 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 they greeted them and said, yeah, well, come, let me, let me, this is the man where we were talking about, the Messiah, Jesus. This is the man that we believe is, is, is God's Savior. And they were introducing him to Jesus. Now, I love this. These were people that they laid their hands on. People that had been sick. People that had been demon-possessed. People that had a, a lifestyle that was so far away from God. And, and now they're coming and he's saying, well, let me introduce you to Jesus. And here's what Jesus does. Jesus sat down and taught them. Jesus gave them what they needed most. He taught them. Everybody say it out loud. He taught them. You see, teaching makes us better. God's Word makes us better. Miracles and healings get our attention, and they even address our physical needs. But God's Word addresses our character, our attitude, our habits, and our lifestyle. Isn't it true? Haven't you come and realize that as you come, you hear God's Word being taught, and oftentimes it, it kind of feels like it's, it, 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 it's, it's you know, touching a, a nerve? Huh? It's, get, it, it's kind of speaking into your life. It's hitting something sensitive. You know, and, and it, it might be about one thing or another, but you've been dealing with it, or it's, and, and the Word of God deals with it. It helps us get better. You see, because healing in and of itself is great for your physical body. But Jesus doesn't want you to just be a, a, a healed deviant. Do you know what I'm saying? Just as bad as you've ever been, except you're healed now. Jesus wants there to be so much more. Somebody say amen. amen. Look at your neighbor and say, I hope he's not talking about you. Just look at him and tell him. Jesus wants so much more. He doesn't want you to just be a delivered jerk, Right? You know, you were a jerk before, but now, you know, the demon's no longer in there, but you're still a jerk. Come on. Jesus doesn't want that. So he teaches them God's word because God's word makes us better. It addresses our character, our attitude, our habits. Jesus taught them. He planted the seeds for life change in them. Isn't that awesome? You ought to give him a hand right there. Because people will ask me to go pray for people at the hospital all the time, and that's great. And there are often times that God heals their physical bodies, but God wants to do more, just like with you. He wants us to grow. He wants us to have develop life change. And so Jesus starts teaching them. And it's awesome. Can you imagine all these people sitting around and Jesus is teaching them, planting the seeds for life change. And, you know, Jesus' teachings were so interesting and inspiring that time flies by. I aspire to be a teacher like that. So that, you know, when you come in and, and you hear me teaching that I've captivated your attention, and before you know it, we're done, you're like, wow, it, 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 you know, it's already over? I aspire. Jesus was like that. You get caught up in the message. He grabs your attention. It's interesting. And, and you're kind of sitting at the edge of your seat and leaning in. And so everybody's doing that. And, and it's, it's, it's exciting. And I find it interesting that the disciples who once complained about people are now concerned about people. You see, just a little while before this, Jesus had taken his disciples on the boat. They had been ministering all day to people. He takes them on the boat and he wants to cross the Galilee. He wants to take them away from the crowd so they can have a little bit of reprieve. And so the thing is, is on the Galilee, it's very small kind of lake, a very small sea, but it's really like a lake, 13 miles long, 7 miles wide, so it was easy for them to see the direction, the people on the shore, to see where the boat was going. And especially if there's no wind to fill the sails and take the boat quickly, they have to row. So the people would just find out where they're going and walk around the shortest way of the lake and get there, and oftentimes they would get there before Jesus did and the disciples. And there they are waiting. 
Okay, so, so listen to this. And the disciples on that one event that I'm talking about were like, oh, shh, oh my God, just can't, that can't get away from these people. Now that's the way they were before. But now they're concerned about people. Now they're concerned. The truth is, it's not until we engage in God's work that we see people through, everybody said how I'd. <laughs> see, before they're an imposition, before they're an interruption, before they're an irritation. Oh my God. Right? Sometimes people feel that way. Not you guys, but the people in the 9 o'clock service, they feel that way. <laughs> Can't find a parking. It's hard to get a seat. I mean, it's, it's just really difficult. It's, you know, this, that, the other thing. But see, when you begin to engage in service, you, that's not a problem anymore. You see people through God. The people have become a wonderful opportunity to see God work. You know, I always say, the, you know, the people who are volunteers here, they never complain about a parking or a seat, ever. Think about it. Just saying. When they see people, they get excited because they know it's an opportunity. The fact that there's not that many seats and it's kind of tough to get in or there's not enough parking gives them an opportunity to, hey. Huh? Gives them an opportunity to serve people. Can you say amen? That's a good place to clap right there. It really is. You begin to see people when, I mean, when we engage in God's work, that's when we begin to see people through God's eyes. I mean, the, those people are no, mo no longer, you know, gypsies, tramps, and thieves to us. No. When you engage in reaching the lost, you see more than gangbangers or users or menaces to society. When you engage in reaching the lost, you see them more than sick or dysfunctional or needy. You see people the same way Jesus does. Sheep in need of a shepherd. Sick who need a physician. Lost souls in need of salvation. That's what you begin to see. And so it's awesome that the disciples are concerned about people now. Well, before they could, you know, were aggravated with them, but now they're concerned. They're telling Jesus, hey, Jesus, you know, because Jesus is teaching. They're saying, hey, Jesus, you know, you're a little long-winded. I mean, andale, let's, let's, let's wrap this up and send these people home. You know, let's, you know how it is when you invite somebody to church and they come with you and you hardly can pay, even pay attention to the message because you're so concerned. Is, how, are they, how are they receiving it? How are they getting it? You know, ah, hope they're getting it. Hope they're getting it, right? Weirdos. <laughs> But it's the truth. That's the way we are, right? And so, and so you know, if, if Pastor Dion's running a little long, you're like, oh, the Pastor Dion, you know, shh. I don't want him to, I don't want, I, you know, we didn't tell you to feed him the whole meal today. You know, it's just, just a little bit, you know. And we act that way. And so that's the way the disciples are. Jesus, Jesus, yeah. There's no place for them to eat and no lodge. There's no lodging. Or, you know, the Tombo Debt doesn't have a motel around here. So, 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 so they, we need to get these people moving. There's no place for them to eat. I really like it. But Jesus revealed that this new problem to the disciples, that there's no place for them to eat, is really an opportunity to do more ministry. Because Jesus told them, you give them something to eat. Let's read it. But Jesus said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, Well, we have no more than five loaves and two fish, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were about, everybody said, 5,000 men. Crazy. Then he said to his disciples, Make them sit down in groups of 50. And they, all, they, and they did so, and made them all sit down. And then he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke them, and gave them to his disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled, 
and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. Woo! Yeah. So the disciples are, you know, there's nowhere for them to eat. Jesus, come on, let's wrap it up. Let's get these people so they can go. And, you know, these are people we know. They can get back home and be safe. And, you know, and Jesus says, you give them something to eat. Whenever we're confronted with obstacles in serving, we tend to complain. You know, we have a million and one excuses why it can't be done. I mean, we're too shy, or, you know, we're too inadequate, or we're just too broke. I'm too broke. I just can't. You know, there are too many people. We don't have enough money. The project is above our ability or means. And the truth be told, we're right if we're doing it alone. If we're doing it in our own power. Even Jesus himself told his disciples in John 15, read it with me, apart from me, you can do nothing. So don't be apart from him. Stay plugged in. Right? Because Jesus will work with whatever we give him, big or small, to accomplish the impossible. So sometimes, you know, you get involved in things and things seem bigger than you actually expected and you start panicking and freaking out and Jesus says, calm down, calm down. What do you got? Everybody ask, ask the question, what do you got? Jesus will, will, will work with whatever we give him, big or small, to accomplish the impossible. Moses offered God his walking stick. Samson presented the jawbone of a donkey. David offered a slingshot. Elijah, his shawl. Their offerings to all of us and to many people seem menial. But put into the hands of a living God, they accomplish the impossible. And it's so awesome. So here's a statement. So stop focusing on what you don't have and focus on what you do have. Kind of like the car full of nuns that were on their way to choir rehearsal. They ran out of gas. When one passerby saw one of the nuns draining a bedpan into the empty gasoline tank, he said, wow, sister, man, that's a lot of faith you got. Woo! That's huge faith. And she said, it's not huge faith. The bedpan was the only thing we could get the gas from the gas station to the tank. You know what I'm saying? It's not a huge faith. Just using whatever we got. Listen, you can sit on the side of the road all bummed out and frustrated, or you can use whatever you have. So stop making excuses and get out your bedpan. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor and say, get out your bedpan. Hey, listen, your bedpan might be your vehicle. You know what I'm saying? You drive yourself to church, but there's three extra seats. <laughs> well, Pastor, I, I, I've got a bunch of stuff in my car, and yeah, I just, I, uh, get it out. Use what you got. Your bedpan might be your Facebook page, your cell phone, your vocational training. I mean, so pass a track, invite a coworker, send a text of encouragement, volunteer here at church. Start with what you have. Make it available to the Lord and He will use it for His glory. He will blow you away. I mean, when the disciples gave Jesus the little boy, the, the little that they had, which amounted to a little boy's lunch, Jesus turned it into, everybody said a lot of what? A feast. Now, my wife can do some amazing things with leftovers. She really can. But multiplying last night's fajitas to feed over 5,000 people, nah, she can't do that. <laughs> only the Messiah, say it aloud, only the Messiah can do something like that. <laughs> now, let me establish something. Luke. Investigative reporter. All he is is documenting the eyewitness accounts of the life story of Jesus. And he, 
placed this particular story of Jesus feeding a multitude. Because it's relevant to who Jesus is. The Savior. The Messiah. You see, he already, Luke already presented or investigated whether or not Jesus is for reals. And found it in history. He not only did that, but he also was proving that Jesus was divine. And talked about miracles. This is another one. But this particular miracle is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. You see, the Bible had talked about in the Old Testament that the Messiah would be a prophet like Moses. Moses provided food or bread in the wilderness for people. And Jesus is doing the same. In fact, here is the prophecy that Moses gave about the coming Messiah. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Here's what it says. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet, everybody, like me from your midst, from your brethren. Well, what did Moses do? Moses miraculously provided bread in the wilderness for all of the congregation of Israel. And Jesus does the same thing here. The miracle builds an even stronger case that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Right? Think about it. It's a fulfillment of Scripture. So Luke's investigation estimated that over 5,000 people were filled. Everybody say the word were what? They were filled. The, I love the Greek word. The Greek word is glutted. Say it with me. Glutted. 5,000 people were glutted. That's the feeling after your Thanksgiving meal. Or, you know, when you're walking out of Golden Corral, you know. <laughs> you know, that feeling. <laughs> Loosening your belt, unbuttoning your pants, popping antacids. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's, the, that's it. Luke probably can't believe it himself, but he's documenting, he's talking to eyewitnesses. Yeah, I was there, man. We, we ate like you would not believe, and the baskets just kept being full. It's unbelievable. So it wasn't like somebody could say, well, maybe, maybe just Jesus cut the pieces really, really small, and everybody got a little bit. Yeah, like 5,000 plus women and children ate from a little boy's lunch. No, it says they were glutted. Stuffed. Everybody said it. Stuffed. So Jesus fed 5,000 people with a little boy's lunch, and then they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. And Gomer Pyle would say, Shazam! Right? <laughs> what is it? What is it? Shazam! Now, every single Old Testament prophet about the Messiah's ministry is being fulfilled. By Jesus. The evidence is undeniable. I mean, think about it. Miracles, everything that the Old Testaments have prophesied is being fulfilled by Jesus. And that's when Jesus comes to the disciples and asks them. In light of all of that, who do men say that I am? Let's read it. You're not getting bored, are you? Here we go. And it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him and he asked them saying, who do the crowd say that I am? So they answered and said, John the Baptist. But some say Elijah. And others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, read this part out loud with me, the Christ of God, the anointed Son of God, Messiah, is what he was saying. Interesting. But he asked them, in light of all the miracles I've done and the fulfillment of prophecy and everything that you know about me, well, 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 the people know about me, what are they saying about me? Well, there are a lot of different opinions and speculations about Jesus. He's a prophet, a rabbi, an enlightened man, a moral teacher. Some thought he was John the Baptist raised from the dead. Others thought he was a forerunner for the Messiah. Not the Messiah, just 
someone is coming ahead of the Messiah. Well, all of those are high opinions and lofty speculations. They are misconceptions. They're misconceptions. You know, like the guy that stumbles out of the bar in the middle of the day, and he's walking in town, and he sees a nun, he runs up over to her, and he body slams her. He says, well, you have to say for yourself now, Batman. <laughs> he's got it wrong. Everybody said, he's got it wrong. And a lot of people have it wrong when it comes to Jesus because their eyes have, or their, their understanding is skewed because the Bible says that their eyes have been darkened and they cannot see the truth. They're wrong. They, I mean, these people who said Jesus were, I mean, these were a lot of really nice things, but they were not weighing all the facts. Jesus is much more than all of those, you know, ascended master, a prophet, a rabbi. So then Jesus looks at his disciples and wanted to hear what their answer was. Who do you say that I am? Now, I'm, sure, I'm sure Jesus kind of probably got a little tense and maybe even bit down hard a little bit because, you know, Peter. Everybody say Peter. Peter. Peter is like the Lloyd Christmas of the disciples, you know, from Dumb and Dumber. You know, Peter is just... Uh, Peter usually says the dumbest things imaginable. So he says, who do you, I, I wonder if Jesus didn't actually even have a little bit of... Who do you guys say that I am? No. Who do you say that I am? But this time Peter had it right. He said, You are the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God. Not one of many, but one and only. Isn't that awesome? I love it. You're one and only. I think Jesus had a smile from ear to ear. And Matthew records Jesus looking at Peter and said, You know what? You got it right. Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but you have gotten this by the Spirit of God. You are dead on. And I think Peter right then might have given a fist pump like this and said, oh, I like it. I like it a lot. That's only what he said. Anyhow. He was right. Looking at all the disciples. <laughs> now listen up. Salvation, heaven, and blessings are dependent on how we answer that question. Who do you say that I am? How you answer that question Leave salvation, heaven, and blessings in the air. It'll either make it yours, or like una paloma blanca, it'll just go all away. Listen to how Paul presented this in Romans chapter 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And there it is. What you believe about Jesus will determine salvation and heaven and blessings. You know, Luke here in our gospel has done an outstanding job of gathering the facts. But the believing is up to us. Look at your neighbor and say, up to you. The believing is up to us. In fact, listen to how John closed out his gospel in John 20. Read this out loud with me. The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. But there are written so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in Him, you will have life by the power of His name. 
The believing is up to us. The record is there. The record of eyewitnesses. These are not just people who are, you know, oh yeah, oh yeah. These are, were eyewitnesses who were a part of it. From time to time, we might be tempted to question or doubt our faith in Jesus. You've probably been there. Is, was Jesus really the Messiah? Did he really live? Well, guys, we have eyewitness records that remind us that Jesus is the Savior. That's what John was saying. We've recorded all these things so that you might know. These were eyewitness accounts so that you might know and believe. And that in the believing, you would have life, abundant life. So guys, whenever that doubt comes, you can remind yourself about the eyewitness accounts that are recorded. And you can wave goodbye to doubt. Everybody, go ahead, wave goodbye to doubt. He's over there. Wave goodbye. Later. Huh? Wave him goodbye to You can wave goodbye to doubt and say hello to life. Amen. Now, what kind of life are we talking about? I'm glad you asked. Last verse of the morning, Psalm 23 says, When you believe and follow Jesus, the Good Shepherd, you can expect this. Last verses of Psalm 23. Here's what it says. Read it with me. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And when I die, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's the kind of life. That's the kind of life. I love it. That's the kind of life you can expect when you believe in Christ and following Him as your shepherd. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Now, all the days of my life. Now, the Hebrew for follow is the word that means hunt you down. So goodness and mercy, God's goodness and forgiveness, God's goodness and Forgiveness is going to hunt you down when you're following him. Isn't that awesome? How many of you, how many of you are, you know, you don't have to go look for it, right? You want it to be, oh, there you are. <gasps> Hello, right? Goodbye to doubt. Hello to goodness and mercy. Because, you know, you guys spend it quick. Hello to goodness will hunt me down. And then, when that day comes, when I cross over the threshold from this life to the next, it's secure. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. Isn't that so cool? Yeah. That is the life that's promised for those who believe and follow. And that's why it's so important to go through the Gospels and to understand what they are trying to present so that it solidifies our faith. So it found, gives us the foundation to our faith. That no matter when doubt arises. And are, are you sure? Are you really saved? You can say, well, that's a given. Because of what this is based on eyewitness accounts. My faith is not a blind leap into some dark chasm. Or some unknowable or uncertainty. My faith is founded on a rock that cannot be moved and that will abide forever, the Bible says. And so that's your faith. So you can just continue to say bye to doubt. Just wave at it and say goodbye. Let's all stand. I hope you learned something this morning. Did you get something? The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to smile on you this week and be gracious to you and give you peace. May the beauty of the Lord be upon you. And may he establish all the works of your hands. I pray that you have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Look forward to seeing you next week. And don't forget, if you're needing somebody to pray with, maybe you're just being drawn by the power of the Holy Spirit inside, or maybe you just realize, I, I, need, to, I, I need some prayer, I need some help. There'll be some leaders standing up here. They love to pray with you. So at the close of this next song, take advantage of it. Come on up, introduce yourself, and watch God work. In Jesus' name, I love you guys.
Yeah.